So the title of the talk is very ambitious. Uh, why do Catholics and Evangelicals uh, think so differently? And that was uh, the title suggested by Greg. I don't take... Uh, <laughs> no, I, I accepted it as a teaser, okay? I'm not here to try to explain why do we think differently. It would be too of an ambitious pro uh, project. Uh, the more modest and realist uh, subtitle is evaluating the Roman Catholic view of scripture. That, that is a more still ambitious, but more approachable uh, uh, subtitle. And of course, in uh, talking about the Roman Catholic view of scripture, we are not only touching on the uh, epistemological structure of uh, Catholic theologizing, which has the Bible uh, having a role, but it needs to be a certain what kind of what, what kind of role is given to the Word of God, the Bible, but also is a way to enter uh, the sources of Catholic imagination, uh, which has in the Bible one of its main uh, origins and sources, but also uh, being also. Uh, the Catholic imagination being also shaped by uh, something different than the Bible. And so it's a good way of introducing even larger uh, strands or topics um, with regards to uh, Roman Catholic theology as a whole. And uh, there are four main questions that we are going to try to uh, wrestle with. Um, the first of which is um, simple but very interesting even given the also the talks that we had uh, in our network in our in these two previous days we, do we have the same bible do we have the same bible and uh, the answer is almost uh, yes uh, we have the same uh, uh, canonical books of the New Testament. Uh, we have uh, the same uh, canonical books of the Old Testament. Uh, Catholic Bibles do also have, not only as, in, as a matter of having them in print, in books, but also they are recognized, the deuterocanonical deuter, books, they are recognized as inspired books and belonging to the canon of the Old Testament. And so the answer is yes and no. Yes, to a larger extent, but not completely overlapping uh, Bibles. I'm not going into uh, historical details about how it came for the Catholic Church to decide to include the uh, deuterocanonical books in the canon of the Old Testament, but the point in this talk is just to uh, remember the ideological import of that decision, not going through the exegetical, historical, uh, ecclesiastical discussions around it, but uh, it was in the context of the Council of Trent. It was one of the main decisions of the Council of Trent in 1546. And in order to support and reinforce the reproposition, reiteration and reinforcement of the Catholic view of the Bible and its relationship with the magisterium of the church, uh, the ideological point that was made in reopening uh, the canon of the Old Testament was to underline a theological point, and I would say an ideological point, that is the authority of the, of the church to reopen, to master, to own, to uh, uh, enlarge the canon of scripture. As the church rejected the scripture alone principle of the reformers, it, it did not, not only rejected it theologically, thematically, but it also wanted to uh, reinforce the point by showing that the church had the authority to uh, reopen a decision that it had previously made as a matter of showing uh, um, the, uh, the, uh, the power of the church to own and to master and to uh, possess uh, the canon in order to show that it was not the canon that had to be, was recognized by the church and the church only having 
a, a receptive uh, role in receiving the inspired books, but the church having had a, uh, an active uh, role in actually determining uh, the canon in its uh, ancient outlook and now uh, having the same authority to reopen the discussion to the point of expanding the list. That's the, the whole point I want to make here. Now, uh, going back to the uh, discussions there, it was an ideological decision uh, in the context of the controversy, uh, rejecting the scripture alone principle and showing not only in theory, but in practice that the church not only spoke about its own authority over scripture, but it also was able and free to reopen uh, the very canon of the Old Testament. Uh, in terms of uh, contents, of course, the uh, deuterocanonical books, they are, uh, especially 1st Maccabees, uh, is used to support in Catholic, Catholic catechism. If you look at the section on purgatory, you find references there on 1st Maccabees uh, chapter uh, 12, uh, pointing according to Catholic interpretation to the, uh, an inference uh, uh, projecting, previewing uh, the doctrine of purgatory. That is the, um, the idea that after uh, death, before entering heaven, there is a, uh, a time of purification where um, something can be done in order to speed the time of the souls waiting to be admitted into heavens by the living uh, church in, in, through uh, its sacrifices and acts of worship and acts of uh, prayer, um, it is possible to impact what happens after uh, death in order to speed the process, the time of purification. That's the only uh, doctrinal uh, important uh, use in the context of Protestant Catholic controversy uh, that um, uh, in which the uh, especially first Maccabees is used uh, to support uh, a specific medieval Roman Catholic uh, doctrine the same encouragement to read it well that's uh, it's of course it's an historical question and uh, as a result of the Council of Trent uh, and the prohibition of, uh, for the laity to um, read and even possess copies of the uh, Bible in the vernacular languages, of course, the, uh, the Catholic Church didn't encourage the laity to uh, have access to the Bible in the national vernacular uh, languages of uh, the Europe of the day. And so it has, it has created a widespread sense of fear for the private reading of scripture. And uh, it has created a culture that has not uh, insisted on the need for uh, individual Catholics or even uh, lay Catholics to uh, take the responsibility to read uh, the Bible uh, in their private life. The Bible was supposed to be mediated by the uh, liturgical practices of the church, uh, and uh, the laity was considered to be the receptive of the recipients of what the church uh, in its institutional hierarchical outlook would uh, uh, then transmit. So it was a further mediated, uh, receptive uh, action, uh, not only from the book to the people, from the book to the persons, but from the book through the uh, medi further mediation of the institutional church than to the people. And uh, in uh, majority Catholic cultures, this has meant that for centuries after the uh, Council of Trent, uh, Bible literacy uh, decreased uh, significantly uh, and the access to the Bible was then mediated through other senses, other uh, practices such as uh, the arts or the liturgy or um, uh, other ways to forge uh, Catholic imagination. It was only at, 
at Vatican II um, 70 years ago that the um, Catholic Church changed its stance towards the circulation of um, translations of the Bible in the vernacular languages and the freedom given to uh, access them, read them, and make use of them. And so that is a, has been a positive uh, outcome of the Second Vatican Council, which has, uh, in a sense, freed uh, the Catholic laity to uh, begin or to uh, in initiate a new phase in um, their engagement with uh, the Bible. And uh, eight years ago, there was also a manual, a, a handbook written on how to preach uh, the Bible in the context of Catholic liturgy. And uh, it would be interesting to go into that as well in looking at the way in which uh, the encouragement to preach or to give the homily is uh, put in the context of uh, it being at the service of uh, the magisterial office of the church and uh, in line with its teaching and uh, preceded and followed by uh, acts of uh, reverent submission to the official teaching of the church in a way that the homily is at the service of a bigger uh, project to reinforce the idea of belonging to the institutional church that has uh, precedence over the hearing of, the, uh, of God's word. And uh, then we, we move on to the question whether or not we have the same high view of Scripture. And, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, we have to make reference to um, 19th century pronouncements with regards to the uh, view of Scripture that the magisterium uh, held at the time. And uh, there are parallels between... Uh, the encyclical by Leo XIII and uh, what can be found in, in the parallel writings coming from sectors of the evangelical Protestant world. Uh, we may make reference to uh, the, the old Princetonians dealing with the doctrine of Scripture and Leo XIII had similar uh, concerns with regards to liberal approaches to scripture and in order to uh, reject them, question them, uh, that encyclical restated the uh, view of the Catholic Church with regards to the inspiration of the uh, uh, biblical books, their uh, infallibility and their even their inerrancy. So there is a high view uh, of uh, the, the Bible uh, presented, defended in the 1893 uh, Providentissum uh, Deus encyclical by Leo XIII. The, prop, the, the issue there is that while the inspiration of the books uh, is uh, reaffirmed, what is different with regards to Protestant accounts of the same doctrine is the absence of any reference to the finality of the Bible, the sufficiency of the biblical books and uh, uh, the Bible as a whole. It is inspired, it is authoritative to a certain extent, it is inherent, uh, but it is not sufficient final. It is not considered as the ultimate finalized uh, word of God. That is where, uh, although there are some overlaps, there are of course, some differences, significant differences with regards to a Protestant account of the same doctrine. Fifty years later, uh, in the middle of the 20th century, uh, that um, strong rejection of liberal readings, higher critical approaches to Scripture were relaxed uh, in the encyclical Divino Afflante Spiritu, uh, critical methods were began to uh, welcome in Catholic, into Catholic exegesis and uh, uh, a more nuanced um, evaluation of uh, liberal critical approaches to scripture uh, 
was then prevented. That was the window through which um, what was previously rejected began to be progressively accepted. Uh, Vatican II had a, a constitution dedicated to divine revelation, Dei Verbum, prepared by Divino Afflante Spiritu. Dei Verbum restates the uh, traditional vision of the Roman Catholic Church with regards to divine revelation uh, coming to us through the means of the recorded, written um, texts of Scripture, as well as it being preceded and followed by the living tradition of the Church that uh, the magisterium, the official magisterium, gives voice to, and resulting therefore in a uh, composite view of the relationship, the dynamics in which divine revelation can be uh, received by, uh, through the church, uh, by uh, the people. And therefore, scripture is only partially involved in the process, having a high profile, uh, has been seen as a necessary uh, transition and uh, uh, stepping stone, but not being, again, fi the final, ultimate, authoritative uh, guide in order for this process to occur. There is a, a much more, uh, there's a bigger picture and a bigger process that takes place when divine revelation um, is received. And scripture is only in part, um, has only a partial role in being part of a much larger uh, process. But that is, you know, the uh, Vatican, De Verbum um, restating or reiterating this triangular interplay between tradition, scripture, and the magisterium, always going together, not being clear, being distinguished, but never to be uh, separated. And uh, the idea that scripture contains revelation, so this language of containing uh, rather than being, rather than being uh, associated with in a more, um, in a fuller way, there is a, there is a uh, discrepancy between what revelation is and, and what scripture is. There is a difference there. Uh, it is not from sacred scripture alone that the church draws her certainty. So it's about epistemological authority, epistemological certainty. Uh, um, the Catholic Church is not committed to uh, the view whereby it is from the Bible alone that we can have certainty. The, uh, the church can have certainties uh, even outside the uh, scriptural attestation and confirmation. And uh, one of the, the proofs of this uh, principle has to be related to uh, the uh, modern dogmas that the Catholic Church has promulgated in the areas of Mariology and papal infallibility. Uh, these dogmas have been given dogmatic status, the highest status possible, belonging to the core of the deposit of faith revealed by God but not necessarily demonstrated by, supported by scripture. So this uh, De Verbum um, makes it clear what the church had already done in the uh, 19th century with the 1854 dogma of Mary's Immaculate Conception, with the 1870 uh, dogma of papal infallibility, and with the 1950 dogma of Mary's uh, bodily assumption. All of these dogmas, if you read them, uh, the, uh, the pronouncements there uh, are not, um, are not, there is no attempt to provide a biblical justification for these dogmas. There is no need because uh, the church draws her certainty about everything which has been revealed, not from scripture alone. So it is important, but not uh, in principle uh, necessary. 
both sacred tradition and sacred scripture are to be accepted and venerated with the same sense of devotion and reverence. They are uh, still distinguished, uh, still considered as organically related, and have to be accepted and venerated with the same sense of <clears throat> devotion. Devotion. So it's not a, dub, a, a dual, double uh, uh, a, a theory of revelation coming through two separate streams, but it's the same revelation that takes uh, that is, is to be received by means of tradition and scripture as an organic whole um, that needs to be received uh, with the same reverence and the same sense of devotion. But what I want to focus on is um, on more recent uh, statements by uh, Catholic Magisterium on the doctrine of Scripture. And uh, uh, I want to uh, focus now on a post-synodical exhortation by uh, Pope Benedict XVI in 2010 after a synod of bishops on the issue of the Word of God in the life of the Church, as it is uh, custom by uh, uh, popes after a synod of bishops receiving the documents, receiving the proceedings, uh, reflecting on the outcomes, and then writing an exhortation in response to what the synod of bishops has uh, discussed. In 20, 2010, this document uh, contains the, um, <clears throat> what Pope Benedict um, wanted to say about the issue of the word of the Lord, verbum domini. And uh, uh, the document recalls the Roman Catholic teaching on the Bible as it has been articulated and uh, thought in the 20th century. In particular, of course, Verbum Domini acknowledges uh, the Vatican II Constitution, De Verbum, as the paramount doctrinal reference for the Roman Catholic theology of the Word of God in the 20th century and sees itself in total continuity with the Council. Continuity. Um, what is most interesting is the relationship between the Word and the Bible that is envisaged by uh, Pope Benedict. To start with, Verbum Domini claims that the Word of God, and I quote, precedes and exceeds sacred scripture. Nonetheless, scripture, as inspired by God, contains the divine Word. So there is a sense that the Word is something that comes prior and something that goes further than the written uh, Word of God, and therefore the Word is only contained in the Bible, but needs to be considered as a much wider uh, reality. Verbum Domini claims that the Bible is the Word of God in some sense, and in the sense that it contains the Word. There is the Bible and there is also a further word beyond the Bible that makes the Bible not sufficient on its own and not to be equated simply with the Word of God. What is at stake here is not the divine inspiration of the Bible, which Verbum Domini firmly affirms in line in continuity with previous teaching, but what is at stake here is the sufficiency of the Bible and its finality in continuity with previous Catholic teaching. For Pope Ratzinger, the Bible is the Word of God in some sense, but the Word of God is bigger than the Bible. The latter contains the former. For Protestants, readers, especially a comment here is in place. Liberal theology has developed its own theology of the Word whereby the relationship between the Word and the Bible is thought of in dialectical and existential ways. In other words, for some versions of liberal theology, the Bible is a 
fallible testimony to the word and it becomes the word of God, if it ever becomes so, when the Spirit speaks through it. Now, the Roman Catholic version of the word-Bible relationship in a, is articulated in a different way. The premise is the same. That is, the Bible contains the word. There is no complete overlap. But the outworking of that word, word comes through the tradition of the Roman Catholic Church. The gap between the word and the Bible is not existential, but ecclesial. The church is the cradle of the word, both in its past and written form, the Bible, and in, in its ongoing utterances, tradition. In this respect, Benedict writes, and I quote, the church lives in the certainty that her Lord, who spoke in the past, continues today to communicate his word in the living tradition and in sacred scripture. Indeed, the word of God given to us in sacred scripture and uh, is an inspired testimony to revelation. Together with the church's living tradition, it constitutes the supreme rule of faith. The Bible is upheld, but the Bible is always accompanied and surmounted by the wider, deeper living tradition of the church, which is the present day form of the church, of the word. Amongst other things, this means that the Bible is not sufficient in itself to give access to the Word and is not the final norm for faith and practice. The Bible needs to be supplemented by the Catechism of the Catholic Church, which is a significant, uh, Pope Benedict, Benedict says, a significant expression of the living tradition of the Church and a sure norm for teaching the faith. So, Verbum Domini maintains a dynamic view of the Word, whereby the Bible is a divinely appointed container of the Word. Yet the final reference point of the Word is the Church, from which the Bible comes from, and through which the present-day Word of God resounds. So, lots of questions arise from the painted picture by, by Verbum Domini, which is totally coherent with Vatican II, indeed, even with the Council of Trent. Since Verbum Domini is not a systematic treatise, but rather a written exhortation, only few points are dealt with in terms of explaining how the Roman Church relates to the Word. Firstly, the role of private revelation. For example, Marian visions, and ongoing revelations accredited by the Roman Catholic Church. Besides the Bible, uh, these private revelation, and I quote Benedict, they introduce new emphases and give rise to new forms of piety or deepen older ones. Private revelations are the basis for the Marian cults of Lourdes, Fatima, Medjugorje, for example, and uh, even though these cults cannot be squared with basic biblical teaching, yet the normative point for private revelation is the church's tradition, not the Bible in and of itself. Secondly, the ecclesial reading of the Bible. According to Verbum Domini, scripture must never be read on one's own. Reading must be always an, ex an ecclesial experience. That is something done in communion with the church. The issue at stake here is not only methodological, as if private readings were to be replaced by study groups at a parish level presided over by a priest, but it is also hermeneutical. I quote Benedict, as authentic interpretation of the Bible must always be in harmony with the faith of the Catholic Church. That is what ecclesial reading means. An authentic interpretation of the Bible but must always be in harmony with the faith of the Catholic Church. There is continuity, there is organic interplay, there is no uh, recognition of the superior, superior ultimate authority of the Bible over the Church, but it's they are all part of the same dynamics. Reading the Bible needs to be an exercise done in accordance with the institutional church, both in its forms and outcomes. 
Apparently, there is much wisdom in these statements, especially considering the real risks of fancy, individualistic, awkward interpretations by isolated readers of the Bible. Yet there is something missing here. For a church that has forbidden for centuries the reading of the Bible in vernacular languages, it is at least unfortunate that not a single word of repentance here is offered. For a church that has prevented the people from having access to the Bible until, until 50, 60 years ago, it is at least puzzling that not a single word is spent to underline the church's need for self-correction and vigilance. Moreover, in, if reading the Bible must always be done under the rule of the institution, what happens if the institution itself is caught in error, heresy, or apostasy? How does the Spirit correct a sinful church, if not by the biblical word? In the history of the church, the teaching of the Bible had to sometimes be played against the institutional church and against its, its consensus. Only a self-proclaimed indefectible church can ask total submission to the watchful eye of the sacred magisterium without having a final ultimate bar. Here at stake is the question, who has the final word, the Bible or the Roman Catholic Church? Since the church is the home of the word, these are words by Benedict, Verbum Domini responds the latter, that is, the church. Thirdly, the practice of biblical interpretation. A properly defined Roman Catholic reading of the Bible requires the acceptance of the unity of the whole of Scripture, and Benedict uh, refers to canonical exegesis, as well as the obedience to the living tradition of the whole church and the combination between the historical, critical, and the theological levels of interpretation, as Benedict uh, calls them. The Roman Catholic Church fears two extremes. On the one hand, it fears the critical arrogance which severs the Bible's unity and rejects its divine origins. On the other, the fundamentalist approach, which offers subjective, arbitrary, and anti-ecclesial interpretations. These are uh, expressions used by Benedict, anti-ecclesial interpretations. So, two brief comments are uh, in place here. First, in the public opinion, Benedict XVI is often depicted as a champion of the spiritual reading of the Bible. For example, in his acclaimed books on Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, for example. Yet Verbum Domini readily acknowledges the benefits of historical critical methods while rejecting their ex ex extreme claims when they are contrary to theological considerations. Though not himself a liberal, Ratzinger does not belong to the same typology of biblical conservative scholarship that can be found in evangelical circles. Any simplistic overlap muddles uh, the waters here. Uh, second, fundamentalism is not defined in any way, yet it is the recipient of strong criticism. No reference to fundamentalist literature is offered, but instead negative statements are made as far as the dictation theory is concerned or the lack of appreciation of biblical language as being conditioned by times and cultures. So there is a kind of a straw man depicted there, a fundamentalist, the, 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 bad, the bad guys, but they're never given a, a reference or a, uh, there's no attempt at defining what fundamentalism is all about. The impression is, is that Verbum Domini here plays against a kind of a straw man. Fourthly and finally, the liturgical context of a proper approach to Scripture. Reading the Bible as an ecclesial experience means that it needs to occur in a liturgical context set forth by the Roman Catholic Church. And here again I quote Benedict, the privileged place for the prayerful reading of sacred Scripture is the liturgy, and particularly the Eucharist, in which 
as we celebrate the body and blood of Christ in the sacrament, the Word itself is present and at work in our midst. So the Word is not to be equated with the written Word. The Word also takes a sacramental dimension that is most evident in the sacrament of the Eucharist. The hearing of God's Word, therefore, is fruitful when certain conditions are present, the administration of the Eucharist and other sacraments. The liturgy of the hours, the practice of gaining indulgences, the recital of the Holy Rosary. According to Verbum Domini, therefore, the Bible can never be alone, but must always be surrounded by ecclesiastical practices and especially sacramental practices which inform, direct, and govern biblical reading, biblical interpretation. In so doing, the Bible is never really free to guide the church, but always conditioned by some ecclesiastical practices uh, of uh, the Roman church. That is, you know, not a systematic, it's not a handbook or a, or a treatise, it's, a, it's an exhortation, so there are points, there are reflections here and there, but Benedict is very much, uh, thinks of himself as being in line with uh, the trajectory of ver uh, De Verbum. Another in interesting uh, document that uh, we can make reference to is the uh, even more recent document coming from the Pontifical Biblical Commission. It's part of the Sacred Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith. Uh, it was a commission established by Leo XIII at the end of the 19th century and uh, occasionally gathers biblical scholars, Catholic scholars, Catholic theologians to produce mainly documents, statements, position papers. And uh, this is not the latest uh, position papers published by the P Pontifical Biblical Commission. The latest one has to do with the Bible and ethics, the Bible and morality, and it came out in 2019. So this is the preceding, uh, uh, the, the document that was produced prior to the latest one. And it's an important uh, document dealing with the uh, topic of the inspiration and the truth of sacred scripture. Very interesting, uh, for a number of reasons, of course. Um, it is an extended document released by the Pontifical Biblical Commission, which is the Vatican's official study group on biblical issues. The title well captures the discussed topic, the inspiration and the truth of sacred scripture. It's a 250-page text, and basically it is an elaboration, a reflection of what De Verbum, Vatican II, had argued as far as the scope of biblical inerrancy is concerned. That is, what that the Bible teaches, I'm quoting uh, De Verbum, the Bible teaches without error that truth which God wanted put into the sacred writings for the sake of our salvation. Uh, De Verbum 11. There is a reference to the Bible being without error, but that reference is restricted, limited to what God wanted to be put into the sacred writings for the sake of our salvation. So it's, an, it's a version of limited inerrancy or limited absence of errors. Uh, what is then the significance of relating inerrancy to this for the sake of our salvation? Is it then a kind of inerrancy that is limited only to the message of salvation? What about the rest of the Bible? How can that which is related to salvation be distinguished from the rest? And who can discern what is without error and what is instead disputable or with error. Roman Catholic theology has then discussing, has been discussing these issues since Vatican II, and the Pontifical Biblical Commission 
has now entered this very important debate. The document attempts to reaffirm and expand on what De Verbum highlights. The truth of the Bible is affirmed, but is related to the project of salvation, or the salvific plan, or again, our salvation. So there is a, a zooming of what it means for the Bible to be without error, concentrating it to the project of salvation, the salvific plan, and our salvation. The detailed biblical overview on the truth of Scripture is understood as limiting the inerrancy of the text to its soteriological purposes. As for the rest, and I quote the document, in the Bible we encounter contradictions, historical inaccuracies, unlikely accounts, and in the Old Testament there are precepts and commands that are in conflict with the teaching of Jesus. More specifically, the Abrahamic narratives are considered more as interpretations than historical facts. The crossing the Red Sea is more interested in actualizing the Exodus than reporting its original events. Most of the book of Joshua has little historical value, and Jonah's story is an imagery account. In the New Testament, the reference to the earthquake in the Passion's narratives is a literary motif rather than a historical report. More generally, the Gospels have a normative value in affirming Jesus' identity, but their historical references have a subordinate function. In other words, the theology of the Gospel is valid, but their historical reliability is less important. How the two aspects can be neatly distinguished is not explained. In the end, the truth of the Bible is restricted to what it says about salvation. Another section of the document deals with the ethical and social issues raised by the alleged truth of the Bible. That is the theme, for example, the theme of violence and the place of women. The hard and offensive texts of Scripture, for example, the conquest narratives and imprecatory psalms, are not read in Catholic services due to pastoral sensitivity. So there is a reference to the fact that in the liturgical calendar, uh, in the plan of Bible readings, these sections are not included in the plan for pastoral sensitivity. According to the document, how can they be the Word of God is difficult to say. Again, the standard criterion to discern the inerrancy of the text, text is, I quote, to look at what it says about God and man's salvation, leaving the rest to the historical critical readings and cultural sensibilities of the time. In a telling final statement, the document says, and I quote, that the goal of the truth of Scripture is the salvation of believers. The implication is that the Bible, is that the Bible says beyond, it is what the Bible says beyond salvation, however defined, is not to be taken as necessarily true in the same sense. What about the role of the church then in this matter? Since the truth of the Bible is not plenary, but needs to be discerned according to its salvific purpose, it is the church that mediates the acceptance and the proclamation of the truth of sacred scripture. And we go back to the interplay between tradition, scripture, and the magisterium. It is the church, the Roman Catholic Church, that selects and limits what is the truth of Scripture? According to the document, then the Bible is true as far as its message of salvation is concerned and as far as higher criticism dictates. Ultimately, it is the church that defines the truth of Scripture and rules over it. The Pontifical Biblical Commission's document, The Inspiration of the Truth of Sacred Scripture, argues for a limited inerrancy of Scripture limited to the message of salvation. 
and reiterates historical critical views about the relative unreliability of the historical accounts of both the Old and the New Testament. It is the Roman Catholic blend of traditional and critical views of the Bible which finally exalts the role of the Church. In liberal accounts of critical views of the Bible, there is the place of the conscience, the place of culture, the place of mainstream cultural trends that have the final say. In the Catholic accounts, it is the church that fills the gap. The Bible is not inerrant in its full sense, and the gaps are filled by what the church establishes when it comes to the message of the Bible. So there are parallel or overlaps with liberal accounts, but there are differences when it comes to how then the gap is filled. It is the church that fills it up. While rejoicing for some fruits of the biblical renewal that is taking place in Roman Catholicism, especially after Vatican II, and with regards with encouragement to all to read the scriptures, the battle for the truth of scripture still is with us. In no way has Rome come closer to the scripture alone principle, that is the obedience to the self-attesting word of God written that truly witnesses to the personal work of Jesus Christ. Roman Catholicism has a nuanced position and a, a relaxed position uh, with regards to uh, inerrancy and the truthfulness of uh, the Bible. That leads us to the final uh, uh, question. Do we have the same interpretation of the Bible? Do we have the same Bible? Yes and no. Do we have the same encouragement to read it? Yes and no. Do we have the same high view of Scripture? No and yes. <laughs> Do we have the same interpretation of the Bible? Again, it's a mixed uh, uh, answer. Uh, because it rejects the scripture alone principle, uh, that has consequences on the way in which the Bible then is read, interpreted, received, and uh, uh, accepted. Uh, what is at stake there is the interplay between tradition, scripture, and magisterium that not only provides the epistemological framework, but also the hermeneutical grid for the Bible to be read. And uh, uh, a case study in the ways in which biblical interpretation takes place in Roman Catholic theology could be developed in analyzing how the modern Mariological dogmas were promulgated as dogmas in recent decades and centuries uh, in parallel with uh, clear biblical teaching and without biblical support. And as a test case of the way in which the interpretation of the Bible takes place in Catholic uh, theology.